Hello. So here we are in the post-impressionist period. The post-impressionist chapter is a clear reaction uh, against, in a way, and really a, a development from the impressionist uh, progress that was being made. And what I want you to be aware of is the differences uh, between those two. They're connected, which is one of the reasons why I, I put the two chapters together in one presentation. I want you to think about what's happening here. Think about the influence of the camera. In the one way, they're rewriting the visual language. They're looking at the world through, you know, a very specific view. And that view is only developing further with people like Toulouse-Lautrec and Cezanne. Toulouse-Lautrec gives us a really clear example of just how different, just how different the, uh, post-impressionists were in comparison to the impressionists. Distinctive brushstrokes, bright color, and uh, distinctive shapes, distinct shapes, rather than large areas of just blended color all over the place. You can see that in parts here and parts here. Things kind of blend into one big muddy mess, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the style, the stylistic differences between the two. So, another thing that Lautrec was famous for was, you know, his work in, with the Moulin Rouge. Obviously, here you have a can-can dancer. He was famous for um, really capturing the essence of that nightlife. And here, La Golou, or the glutton, is considered the grand dame of all can-can dancers. The glutton, as she was called, was known for her high kicks, uh, the can-can dance, and during these high kicks, she would go throughout the crowd with those very high sweeping kicks, and so there you are sitting in front of her, she swings her leg over, and what you don't know is, behind that big leg, or behind that big dress and the leg that she's showing you, and believe me, showing that much leg at the time was kind of a big deal, she would actually be taking a, uh, taking your drink. She would sweep her leg over, grab a big swig of the drink, put it back on the table, and all in one fell swoop, she has made this dynamic uh, acrobatic maneuver, which led to the can-can dance. And, of course, if you see the movie Moulin Rouge, you'll see examples of the can-can. Perhaps one of, the, one of the big champions of the abstraction that is post-impressionism is Cezanne. And what I want you to be aware of is two, two different directions that post-impressionism takes. On the one hand, you have um, a filtered view. That's what I like to call it. Um, in the same way that Instagram and Photoshop, they give you these different filters to apply to photographs, that's what Cezanne is really doing. He's breaking down how we see space, and more importantly, he's breaking down that space and simplifying it uh, with color, with brush strokes, and, you know, when you look at this portrait, you don't see uh, a two-month or a two-year painting. You, you understand what's there, you understand that there's a beard, there's a large forehead, you know, a simplified background that's a landscape perhaps. You can tell that, you can tell that there is light from this side moving to that side because of the lights and the highlights on his shoulders and of course on his head. So while the brushstrokes themselves are much more simple, they still communicate that essential uh, gesture or essence. Now, one of the other words you want to learn here is called impasto. And impasto is not a pasta. It's not an imposter. It is simply a thick, thick application of paint. And with that thick application of paint, he could build those colors very quickly, just like dip in the paint, slap it on, move it around some if need be. That's part of what Cezanne did. And this is a man, ladies and gentlemen, who influenced Matisse, who influenced Picasso, and you can start to see that influence or start to th see it more when you look at Mont Saint Victorie. 
the mountain of St. Victory. Whatever you want to call it, I don't speak French. Um, I can try, and it's fun to try, but anyway. What do we have here? We have that filtered view much more clearer. This is a very immediate painting. And he has broken down the highlights, the shadows, into a very simplified form. We're going to see that simplified form in more detail when we look at Surat uh, with his pointillism. But instead of pointillism here, we see larger strokes, simple, quick strokes. Uh, one quick application of, of paint here and then moving on to the next one, just building it up very quickly. One thing you should be aware of, the cracks in the canvas along the top and the bottom are not part of the painting. They weren't intentional. It's really more incidental than anything. It's something that happens when you roll up a canvas. And, you know, the next time we meet in class, just ask me what it's about, and I can certainly show you, but it's just one of the hazards of constant wear and tear on a painting. Um, Paintings are made on canvas, and those canvases are stretched. Sometimes they're stretched multiple times. You know, maybe someone likes it the certain size, or perhaps they want to transport it, so they take it off the wood, the stretcher bar that holds or supports the canvas. And when that happens, chips of paint fall off. Now, moving on, what I want you to think of here is... With Cezanne, with Cezanne and with Surat, you have that filtered view. You have, you know, that very simplified scene. It's a great technique. It's loaded with detail, and that that sense of detail, or as he called it, divisionism, made for some really incredible painting. We can zoom in, and just in like just like that scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, we can become keenly aware of what's happening with this little girl's face. Far away, it's not such a big deal, but as we move in closer and closer, we become more aware of the subtle differences. Now, what I'd like to do is show you an extreme close-up of this painting, because this is only a fraction of the detail at hand. Hold on just a moment, please. So obviously, if you see Ferris Bueller stay off, there's this incredible scene inside the Art Institute of Chicago. They're looking at some of these incredible works of art throughout the ages, uh, whether it's Expressionist, Cubist, uh, what have you. And we will be looking at some of these pieces like the Blue Man with a Guitar, or this incredible painting of a mother bathing her daughter, or the work of Modigliani. I'm not, I'm not trying to impress you here, we're going to be looking at these pieces, but what I really want to bring your attention to is the, the last and one of the really poignant moments of this whole montage or scene. That's talking about Surat here. Um, there's a real critical moment. It's coming up. Yeah, they're having fun looking at art, Picasso's, and here it is. So, standing at a certain distance to that painting, you're going to see a certain image. And that image from far away makes a lot of sense. It's people, it's people in a park. But as you get closer, and we get a sense of that here, but as you get closer, it changes. Just how much? Let's see. Okay, kissing, blah, blah, blah. But here's the part that I don't want you to be aware of. This is divisionism. Now we got that close up in the PowerPoint, but let's get closer. See all those dots? Those dots are really what's happening there. When you get really close, that image breaks apart. It ceases to be that image. So it, it really does break apart. So obviously this painting means a lot to Cameron at this moment. And even here you can see those are just daubs, points, like the points you would see in a monitor in an old TV, perhaps when you were growing up. Those points coming together taught Surat something incredibly important. More than just a way to drive himself insane with the hundreds of thousands of dots here, when you put a yellow dot next to a blue dot, well, what does that do? Well, the yellow is going to influence the blue, and that's going to make green. 
Now that may seem obvious to you now, but back then, no one really thought about the interaction of color on this level. Surratt was thinking about that, and that was a monumental step forward. Uh, not necessarily in just the understanding of color, but how to apply it. When we look at even just a fraction of the close-up that we have here in the film, we can see those colors coming together. It's not just a nice pink, it's, it's purples, it's reds, it's blues, it's greens, just in the little dress. When we look at that little girl's face, it's not just flesh tones, it's all sorts of little colors working together to make that incredible pointillist or divisionist, remember he referred to it as divisionism, work of art. So what Cezanne and what Surratt did was they, they showed us the world through a filter, like in Photoshop. And this new filter does things that cameras can't quite yet do. This is before Photoshop, so they're giving us a, a mental Photoshop. But it's missing something. When you look at the work of Cezanne, when you look at Surratt, there's something missing. And that's the other side of the coin for the post-impressionists because enter Van Gogh. Van Gogh uses that filtered view but more to the point he adds something that in a way Gauguin, that, sorry, that Seurat and Cezanne never really added into their work and that is emotion, expression. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Van Gogh was a deeply troubled man. He had serious issues, but he took that pain, he took that agony, and he funneled it, he fueled it into something so much more. He explored the world, and this was not just a, a simple mad genius. This was a guy who had a strong education, a strong background. He had lived in the city, and he, he wanted something more. So, uh, trying to find a new Eden, a new peaceable kingdom, to use a, a phrase we're familiar with from class, he moved to the country. Thinking that if I move to the country, I can, I can uh, shed, shed away the baggage of the city, the, the baggage of classical education and culture in Paris. I can write a new visual language that is my own voice. It's a rather romantic notion, and obviously Van Gogh did that. Was it well received at the time? No. But obviously now we honor, revere, and enjoy all of his works with great relish. At least many millions of people do. Now, how did he add emotion to this work? You really need only look at this blue self-portrait. Um, in this portrait, What's going on? Well, uh, let's get a close-up. Let's just zoom on in and think about what's happening here. Well, he's breaking the fourth wall. He's looking right at us. And he looked pretty serious, or perhaps he's tired. One thing you need to be aware of is this kind of, the look on his face is really common for artists making self-portraits because they're trying to make that... You know, they're trying to paint themselves. They want it to look good. They want it to look right. So that takes concentration. Clearly, Van Gogh is concentrating on the self-portrait, but there's something more that he's doing there. It's the color. This is really almost a monochromatic painting. And what does monochromatic mean? It means one color. How is it monochromatic? Well, almost the entire painting is blue. His skin is a cast of blue. Even parts of his hair, which is red, has bits of blue in it. The entire thing is blue. So what does that say? Is he blue? Is he depressed? Is he blue? You know, and in some circles, blue is associated with, with uh, off-color humor or sex or things that you don't normally talk about by day. Blue humor or blue topics. Is it about that? Is he trying to engage us in blue subjects? Or is he sad? Is he depressed? Is he frustrated? When you take that color and add to the fact the way he painted that blue background, look at what's going on there. 
there's a constant movement of those brush strokes and those brush strokes lead into his his jacket the texture of his jacket and this movement is clearly by design it never stops perhaps he is fading into the background perhaps he sees himself as an invisible man perhaps he you know sees himself as uh, a sad lonely soul living in a sad chaotic world there are lots of ways to interpret this but to say that this painting means nothing might in some cases in some circles be a mistake or short-sighted something is being said here clearly van gogh took that pain took that emotion and um, you know funneled it into some of the greatest works in the western world and is often considered the 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 next great master of of holland not since rembrandt many people consider him the greatest since rembrandt in that area the greatest dutch artist since the baroque period now moving on we have uh, a one-time roommate of van gogh's and uh, you know we learned a lot about van gogh his time with gauguin uh, his time in the country from his letters with his brother, Theo. And um, part of that time he spent with Gauguin, he, he was able to lure him out to the country, and, well, Gauguin and Van Gogh did not really get along very well. They fought, they drank together, they fought together, and Van Gogh just kind of rubbed his hands of it and said, deuces, I'm off. South of France was not far enough from the city. It was not far enough from academic traditions and the art world of Paris. Where did he go? He went to the other side of the planet, all the way to Tahiti. So think about Tahiti in the 19th century. This faraway land, surely this is a new Eden. This is a place where I can create a pure new language, a new type of art that is free from all the baggage of Europe. Well, one thing I guess Paul didn't know is that wherever you go, your baggage goes with you. Think about it. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But let's talk about this work. We have a... We have a development that has clearly started with Manet, clearly started with Renoir, and moved on from that. The body of this person on the bed, the woman, looks somewhat flat. We have that filtered view, but this is charged with emotion. Whether you think about the poem by Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven, the raven is there in the window seal. Is the raven bugging the person in the bed, or is the raven speaking to something else? When you look at that person in the bed, are they acknowledging the two people there, or is, or is that person with the black hair, is that the person that's in bed? Are they talking about them, or is that something else? Looking at the sheets, you have white sheets except by the feet. Are those sheets, are those extra sheets that are red, or could that be blood? Could that be blood related to pregnancy or uh, uh, another another facet of the female body, uh, the menstrual cycle? Could it be that? Could it be pregnancy or could it be a sheet? Could it simply refer to something else? Obviously, coming from Europe, colors play a strong role, especially in the Christian language. Could it be related to sin or something else? There's a lot of different things being said here. So you have that filtered view in the work of Gauguin, but you have also emotion, gravitas. And what I said before about him bringing the baggage with him, it's best seen in this work. Because Gauguin was more than just a painter. He, sp he was bringing European culture and ideas with him. And you see that here. Gauguin was a bridge between these two cultures. When you look at this figure, this sculpture, obviously you see a lot of different influence. Okay, So the sitting style figure is commonly associated with Buddha. But that shell above his head is really thought of or commonly associated with halos. 
So you have Buddha, you have Christ, but in neither picture or in neither figure does Buddha or Christ have sharp, sharp fangs, right? I mean, mm, that would be kind of a gruesome scene to see Christ step up with a bunch of fangs. And, and I don't mean just two fangs, but a whole row of super sharp teeth. Is that a pagan? Is that an... Is that something from Indonesia or Oceania? Is that something from Tahiti where the gods had sharpened teeth? Is he a cannibal? You know, this kind of figure is a bridge between these. He, he had this desire of finding a new utopia, a new peaceable kingdom. But what he failed to realize is that wherever he went, he brought Europe with him because he was European. So you have two artists from two different facets of post-impressionism. You have Surat, you have Cezanne, with that filtered view, a progression of the reaction against and with cameras and photography. And while their work is beautiful, it didn't have the emotional energy of that other side, which is Gauguin and Van Gogh, charging their work, charging those colors with meaning. And while we're talking about color, we can then move on to symbolism. When we look at this uh, work by Moreau, we see Galatea. Galatea, the object of Polyphemus' ultimate desire. And when you look at the terms here under symbolism, make a note of it, because I've, I think I've done a pretty good job, or we've done a pretty good job of rendering this down to the essential meanings behind the movement. A symbol is something that stands for something else. So here, the light color of her skin, that creamy, milky, off-white, represents what? Cleanliness? Is she zestfully clean? Maybe. It refers to innocence, purity, perhaps even chastity, whereas look at the cyclops in the background. His skin is red, it is orange, it is charged and glowing, especially against that blue background. Where are his eyes? His eyes are recklessly heading towards Galatea herself. So this is, this is a painting that is using color to symbolize lust and innocence. They weren't, the symbolists weren't concerned with, you know, social justice or issues. They were concerned about these, we're kind of getting back to romantic ideas and showing, using color for what it can do. Not just a way to describe, but a way to imply. That is at the heart of what symbolism is really dealing with. These are well-read men. The exchange of ideas is strong right now. The, the Moulin Rouge is rich with writers, thinkers, painters, musicians. It is a cultural revolution. Not, a, not so much a revolution, but a cultural explosion. And from that we get some of the ideas behind the symbolist movement. Now leading the charge further is Edvard Munch. He takes he takes color, the meaning behind it. He takes the filtered views of, of uh, post-impressionism. He mixes that together to create a cocktail, which is perhaps one of the most famous paintings in, a, in that top 20 that I keep referring to, the screen. Obviously, it's not just about color, but it's about those brush strokes. You have a contrast between straight lines, static, strong, still lines, versus curvilinear, lyrical, moving lines, hectic lines that lead us all around. In the foreground you have a figure holding their face, screaming. Their body is writhing, just like the river, the clouds, the land above. Contrast that with the road, the bridge, which is faithful, true, straight and diagonal, leading up to these two figures that are not writhing, that are not bending, but in fact they are upright, they are vertical, they are still. So is this about someone that can't even? To use a phrase from the internet, I can't even, oh, I just can't. 
is this a man full of suffering versus those that can't, you know, even see the forest for the trees? They can't see the, the chaos of nature? This is where art is going. It's more than just a description of what someone sees. It is more than just a painting to glorify someone. It's more than just a decoration. And it is more than just education. Art now is making statements by someone that have no basis in the classical tradition. The trails that were blazed in the previous two chapters are now being followed and pushed even farther with the symbolists, with the post-impressionists. We move on to the last work of this chapter, or the last work we're going to discuss, and we, we looked at artists before that had no formal training. We call them folk artists. Uh, another term for this is naive painting, and at this time, you know, we're breaking over into the 20th century, we have Henry Rousseau. And naive painters can get away with a lot because they're not bound by that training, they're not bound by the baggage of history and influence that the academic tradition or the classical education had. When you look at this painting, which is called A Dream, obviously it's playing on a lot of different images. And um, at this time, Sigmund Freud was writing a great deal about dreaming. So psychoanalysis, the psychology, the study of the mind and what the mind comes up with is clearly an influential thing. You know, a hundred years ago, it might have been philosophy on freedom, philosophy on man's obligation to the world. Now they have, they have explored the world and man is looking inward. And it is the works of Freud which are fueling new ideas, especially for the symbolists. In this work, you have a woman, naked, vulnerable, ready to explore a mysterious jungle. You see the wild animals, you see the flora and the fauna, but more to it is a figure, a mysterious figure, fading into that jungle. If you can't see him, I'll tell you this, he's playing a flute and wearing a skirt. You have the beautiful flowers, you have the tiger, the snake, the bird, you have fruit on a tree. There's only one tree in the painting that has fruit. There are two tigers, or perhaps two lionesses. You have a snake, you have a man. You also have a bull. You know, is this referring to a Garden of Eden, or is it simply a dream? One great artist said, sometimes a pipe is just a pipe, it's just a pipe. It doesn't mean anything else. Well, why is she on the couch? Rousseau said the couch was in there because he just needed some red. Or perhaps was he trying to say something else? The couch is a vehicle. On the couch, we sleep. When we sleep, we dream. So this couch takes me to this dream world that is this pure, wild, mysterious jungle where men play flutes and, and uh, tigers don't eat me. Rich symbols to be drawn upon and analyzed by the works of, by the minds of people like Freud. This is what the symbolists could play with. And this is what they did play with. Now, whether he added the couch as a vehicle or whether he added the couch simply because he wanted to add red, only Rousseau knows for sure. What we do need to realize now is, what we need to understand is, artists are using this newfound freedom. They're using this freedom that was carved by those previous movements the last two chapters before. They're not following the academic tradition. They're exploring their own voices. They're exploring their dreams. They're exploring their frustration. They're dealing with their pain and they're dealing with their baggage in very different ways. And it's creating new movements, profound images, and opening the door for artists that are going to come in the early 20th century. And we'll talk about that in the next chapter. And ladies and gentlemen, it is a big chapter because of a man... A little man from Spain called 
Pablo Picasso and a little man from France named Henry Matisse. Best of luck. As always, if you have any questions, do please let me know, either through email, by calling, or uh, just uh, drop them by the office. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you in class.